Ghost. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Father James. In scouring the internet for sermon ideas, I came across this study. It's called the McRae Study on the Dynamics of Spiritual Gifts, and it was conducted at the Boston University School of Theology. The researchers wanted to find out if Bible students really were good Christians. In order to conduct this experiment, they enlisted the help of 40 volunteers, and they divided the volunteers into two groups of 20 each and told them that they were conducting research in church careers. They were counseled individually and were asked to go to another building one at a time and make a tape recording on uh, an assigned topic. One group was given the topic of uh, career concerns while the other group was asked to talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, that was all the students were told. Unknown to them, the researchers had planned a little surprise. They'd hired an actor who stood on the sidewalk which led to the building where the students were to give their tape reports. As each student walked along, the actor would suddenly slump to the ground, moaning and groaning, and acting as if he had uh, been, uh, suffered a sudden heart attack. And the real purpose of the experiment was to see how many of the students would stop and help this victim, and how many would simply walk on by. Walk on by. I do that every time I hear those two words, I don't know. Well, I don't guess you're going to be surprised at all to hear that half the students just According to the researchers, some who were planning their dissertation on the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the slumped over a good person to get to where they were going. Well, so what can we conclude from this? I think two things. First, there's a big difference between talking about the Good Samaritan and actually being one. Second, that there's not much difference between anyone in that story and a lot of us average churchgoers. A lot of us would have walked on by. I know I would have, unless I knew the person. Uh, I probably would have stopped then, but I, I say that without the slightest bit of hesitation because no, it's true, I know how I am. <laughs> but the point this morning is not about the people who walk on by, but rather it's about the people who stop. Those people, that small select group, are the focus of this homily. What makes some people stop while others keep on walking? There's many answers to that question, but here's one that I think. The people who stop have a certain spiritual gift which actually causes them to stop and help someone in need. It doesn't just cause them, it kind of forces them to. That's the way they're made up. It's not the gift of stopping. Instead, it's the spiritual gift of showing mercy. So, showing mercy is not just a command of Scripture. It's also a spiritual gift. Some people have it. Some people don't. The people who have it, you can always count on them stopping every time. This morning, I want to talk about the spiritual gift of mercy, what it is, and how it works. First, we need to kind of get a definition. Uh, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability which enables every believer to effectively serve the body of Christ. You'll also have to remember that a spiritual gift is not the same thing as a natural talent. Some people have a natural talent of singing, dancing, playing pianos, cooking, organizing, bothering people. <laughs> but there's, there's a difference. Natural talents are God-given abilities, but we get those from our earthly families. <laughs> We are born with natural talents. We're born again with spiritual gifts. And with that in mind, we turn to the gift of showing mercy. As far as I could tell from all the little bit of research I did on this, there is only one reference to mercy as being a spiritual gift, and that in the whole New Testament. And it comes from our gospel reading today. Romans 12, 8 says, and I'm paraphrasing, if it's someone's spiritual gift to show mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Mercy in the biblical sense is uh, compassion for those in need. It's compassion to action. A desire to help uh, that moves someone from uh, emotion to a decision to action. Mercy is to be a characteristic of all Christians. All of us are merciful, or should be. But God gives 
uh, has given some the exceptional ability to show them mercy. It enables those few to see the needs around them and to move toward filling those needs. Now, note, if you will, the qualifier that Paul added to that gift. He says to exercise it with cheerfulness. I know we all know we've had the experience of someone trying to cheer you up, and when they left, you felt worse than you did before they came. <laughs> that is not the gift of mercy. <laughs> mercy given cheerfully is like a ray of light that shines into your heart and just kind of pushes the dark clouds away. Uh, I think it's a gift that is the number one gift that's sorely needed in this world today. Uh, there are so many hurting people in the world. If we started here in this congregation and we looked outwardly into the community, we would find a world of hurt behind lots of faces. Behind almost every door is a story of sorrow and disappointment. Name a human problem, you can find someone in church somewhere that has it. If not, then somewhere in the lives of those they love. That's why God gives us the people. I call them mercy people, but they're the gift of, of mercy. They have a special ability to see the needs of others. Their hearts are easily touched and they instinctively reach out. They lead us to people that we might not look at, ones that we may overlook. Uh, they understand the language of the heart and their greatest joy is to lift the burden off of someone that's struggling. It's easy to see who's on the receiving end of the gift of mercy. It's the hurting, the helpless, the blind, the deaf, the sick, the infirm, the elderly, the handicapped, the dysfunctional, the shut-ins, the grieving, the imprisoned, the suffering, the weak, and all those who are emotionally distraught. I'm emotionally distraught. <coughs> but, there are, but these are the people that we tend to overlook because they're out on the fringes of life. By definition, they don't fit the pattern of being healthy, happy, well-adjusted people. It's easy to skip over them just to pass on by, but the mercy people stop because they see someone in need. The Boston study found that there are different categories of people in every church. First, there are those people who don't see a need until it's pointed out to them. And then there's those kind of people that see the need, but they wait until they're asked to help. Then there are those who see the need and get involved without waiting to be asked. That last group owns the gift of mercy. Mercy is simply seeing a human need and moving to meet that need. It doesn't matter whether it's big, small, happy, or sad. If it means putting your plans on hold, then you do it. If it means stopping on the side of the road and changing somebody's flat tire, you do it. If it means providing heating pads and chicken noodle soup, you do it. Mercy is seeing a need and moving to meet it in a compassionate way. And the number of ways to use a gift of mercy is almost infinite because the number of human needs is almost infinite. And this church is blessed to be filled with mercy people. Remember, not everyone will have the gift. In fact, most of us won't. But that's all right. We each have our own special gifts. And God has given each of us grace to use our gifts with Christ-like actions of mercy. So, to whom should we extend this gift of mercy? Our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Who passed by on the other side? Well, first it was the priest, and then it was the Levite. It was the religious people who didn't have time, or didn't care, or didn't want to get involved, that didn't stop. And who stopped to help the man? It was the Samaritan, a man the priest and the Levi despised. It was him who saw the victim and took pity on him. It was the Samaritan who bandaged the wounds, poured on the oil and wine, loaded him on the donkey, took him to the inn, and paid for the stay out of his own pocket. Most of us get so wrapped up in ourselves that we don't see the needs of others. Or if we do, we tend to walk away. But thank God it doesn't have to be that way. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the lawyer asked, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus told him that great story. When he got through, Jesus said, well, Which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who had fell victim to the robbers? The lawyer answered, The one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Who is my neighbor? 
My neighbor is anyone in need who crosses my path whose need I'm able to meet. That's simple enough. Mercy is nothing more than meeting the needs of those around me with the resources I have on hand. Mercy is not an organization or a program. It's just people caring enough to get involved. Not long ago, I had a thought, and I know Denny thinks that's strange because he thinks I'm false. No, but I was thinking, Jesus died to create a bunch of merciful men and women who go out into a wounded world and bind up the broken. And sometimes it seems like the evil is multiplying. And then I think to myself, well, no, maybe that's not it. Maybe it's just the merciful is decreasing. In the history of mankind, ours will go down as a most unmerciful generation. There will, there's just been too much killing, too much cynicism, too, too much moral decay. Who would dare walk the streets of Chicago after dark? Who is surprised by news of yet another corrupt politician, yet another war or another plague? We are the most technologically advanced nation in the world, but it seems to make no difference in the way we treat other people. A thousand years from now, what will historians have to say about us? Well, at this point in the sermon, there are some preachers who will sum it all up, and they'll say a prayer that's such a powerful plea that the congregation's hearts will be moved and their spirits will be uplifted. And since I'm not good enough to do that, I'm going to use somebody else's words instead of my own. These words come from a man named Peter Marshall. He was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate in the years following World War II. This is his prayer before the Senate session on Friday, June the 4th, 1948. And he said, Lord, we are ashamed that money and position speak to us more loudly than does the simple compassion of the human heart. Help us to care as you care for the little people who have no lobbyists, for the groups who sorely need justice. May it be the glory of our government that not only the strong are heard, but also the weak, not only the powerful, but the helpless, not only those with influence, but also those who have nothing. May we put our hearts into our work that our work may get into our hearts. There are many reasons that we might not be merciful. Foremost, I think, is in today's world, it requires us to be so busy taking care of ourselves that we have very little time left over to give to others. Mercy is hard work. We struggle with it. We struggle up against it. But it is the work of God. Mercy is nothing more than caring for people the way God cares for people. As, as the chaplain said, may we put our hearts into our work, that our work may get into our hearts. Let's not just say that, but let's go out from this place into a world of need and show them mercy, show them Jesus, show them the face of the merciful God. Amen. 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 Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive.